clicked to go live, if you can confirm that we're getting, we're streaming, it's preparing. Good to go. It's working, right? Yes. Okay, that's a good start. Yeah, it is. <laughs> <laughs> so, a uh, good morning, everyone. I'm very, very excited. Uh, I, I think it's the first time in the semester that I'm introducing our first speaker. And it was fun. It was fun just getting everything ready for today. It is like we always like to share. We're very, in that sense, very open that how it makes us all nervous and stressed or something may go wrong. We do the best we can and we met in preparing for, for the talk and we think we have it ready to go. So welcome back to the Frontiers in Social Evolution Seminar Series. I'm gonna share my screen to just share with you some basics. Uh, I think you must have now my, the image there, right? You see the, so welcome to the, to the spring 2022. We are gonna be completing two years of the seminar. Uh, and once again, I wanna thank Lauren and Carsten for inviting me to join them back then. It's been an amazing ride and we're getting more and more excited by the day. We are now up to 600 people who are listed in our list. Uh, and, and many of them uh, watch the presentations via YouTube as well. They join us in Zoom. So it's very, very exciting. And I mentioned Lauren and Karsten. I want to also be fair to Adriana Maldonado Chaparro, who joined us, who is now the fourth person getting the, the, the series going. And I, it wouldn't be fair not to mention the amazing group of undergrads who are working behind the scenes. They don't get to talk as much as maybe we do when we introduce you guys, but they are behind everything we're doing. Uh, Facundo Fernandez Duque, Jean QQ, Chayan Smith, and our last addition is Mari Roberts. Some of you may be getting messages. Actually, you will be getting messages from her because she's helping us with all types of communication with the speakers and participants. So we have a, a wonderful series plan. I think we're up to 16 or 18 talks. We're going through June 21st. Today, our first speaker is Dr. Marlene Zook from the Department of Ecology, Evolution and Behavior at the University of Minnesota. And I'm gonna remove that because otherwise you're gonna be looking at the abstract in, instead of listening to me tell you something interesting about Marlene. And there's so many things I could tell you. Uh, let's go uh, with the beginning. Uh, Marlene got her PhD from the University of Michigan in zoology in 1986. And after doing a postdoc in New Mexico, if I remember well, she became a professor at UC Riverside where she stayed for several years before going on to the University of Minnesota where she's now a professor. The way she describes most of her research program is with a focus on behavioral ecology, where she's interested in sexual selection and reproductive behavior. Also does, of course, we're all familiar with it, acoustic communication. She also introduces herself as an evolutionary biologist, trying to understand how host-parasite interactions may have influences on behavior. Uh, what can I say about Marlene that wouldn't take all 50 minutes we need to give her for presenting her research? She has almost 200 publications. She, early on, she got an NSF Young Scientist Award that was followed by all kinds of elections to being fellows in different societies, including a fellow of the Animal Behavior Society, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the American Association for the Advancement of Science. And three years ago, she was admitted into the National Academy of Sciences of the US. Uh, she has no shortage of grants that have allowed her to do the kind of research that she's done. Uh, so an impressive CV. What I wanna spend a little bit more time this share with you because I think that sets her even more apart than all the other things is that the, how much time and energy she's put into communicating science to a general public. And for doing that, uh, I wanna call your attention to four books that she's published. Uh, polyphantasy, sexual selections, sex on six legs, and riddle with life. But it's not just the books. I mean, if you if you visit her website, you'll see. I mean, it, it's it's everywhere. Her efforts in trying to bring evolutionary biology and evolutionary sciences to the general public. I learned from her that those of you who have enjoyed those books need to keep your eyes open because she will treat us to a new one coming out this coming summer. 
So this is not out there yet, but you may want to mark you may want to mark your your calendars to check it out. Today, Marlene will be presenting to us a, a talk titled "Adaptive Signal Laws and the Role of Behavior in the Establishment of Novel Trades." The way we usually run the series is that Marlene will talk. Uh, for 50 minutes or so. We know that some of you need to go at noon Eastern time. So we will finish the presentation sometime around noon. At that time, we open a one hour session of questions and answers. And I'll remind this when we get there, but the idea is that you just type a question mark in the chatting window, and we will be calling you in the order that you enter the question mark. The spirit of the fine seminar is to really welcome and engage and give space and time to our young colleagues and students. So when we go through the questions, we do our best to really get students asking questions and participating in the conversation. I know more, many of you, many of the questions, that, many of the students there, so please don't hesitate to, to raise your questions. We wanna hear from you as well. With that, I think that uh, we can give control of the screen and the meeting to Marlene. Marlene, welcome. It's a pleasure having you join us and we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Uh, okay, let me, there we go. All right, everybody can see. Um, I assume that everybody can see the screen and we're all doing okay. Yep, thanks for the thumbs up. Um, and uh, like everybody during the past two years, I've been giving uh, a bunch of um, Zoom talks and um, I just wanted to point out that I'm, um, uh, I'm really excited to see everybody here and it was great um, coming in a little early and seeing some, some old friends, just like Eduardo said. Um, but I will say that I've, I've always had a hard time keeping my eye on the chat while I'm doing this. So um, if you have burning questions during the talk, I'm afraid I'm gonna have to ask you to to wait till the end and we'll, I, will, I will absolutely try and answer them then. But I've, I've discovered that my attention span is just not such that I can look at the chat and look at my slides all at the same time. So, so hopefully, hopefully that's okay. All right. Um, so as Eduardo said, I was gonna talk about um, uh, behavior and its role in the establishment of novel traits. And what I'm doing here is giving you a slightly different talk than I've given over the last little while by combining two things that I've been thinking about a lot for a while. And one of them has to do with the nature of behavior. So is behavior, and, and I, I'm talking about that in part because I feel like behavior is often thought to be kind of different from other traits. And so if I tell people that I study animal behavior, part of why I put evolutionary biology as sort of a separate entry in my um, list of research interests is that people somehow think, oh, if you study behavior, that's kind of squishy and it's not really serious. And it's not like studying morphology or the evolution of life history or something like that. And I think that this idea that behavior is kind of different um, has a lot to do with the, the, the seemingly never going away nature nurture debate. The idea that, oh, you know, where do, you know, where do traits come from? Do they come from how, from um, how we're raised, from our culture? Do they come from our genes? There has to be this dichotomy. And a point I'd like to make is that that dichotomy seems to not be an issue when we're talking about morphology. So no one ever agonizes about whether your liver size is the result of your genes or the result of say your diet or your environment. I mean, we all in this audience, I'm sure realize that it's both. But with behavior, that's not true. If you want to, and, and, and the news you know, headlines will substantiate this, that every other day, it seems like there's a headline that says, oh, um, you know, the tendency for divorce is in your genes. Oh, dog ownership is in your genes. And, and neither of those, I did not make up either of those examples. Both of those are absolutely true that, you know, that, that people absolutely, you know, that's, that's what people want to talk about. And I, I feel like that's part of, that behavior is part of, or, or this idea that behavior is special or different is part of why the nature nurture controversy has dogged us for so long. But what I want to argue here 
and use some of my own research to, to investigate is the idea that behavior is actually not any different. It evolves just like other traits do. Selection operates, mutation operates, drift, gene flow, all of them are components of the evolution of behavior, just like they're components of every other kind of trait. Now, it's certainly true that behavior, it's, it's hard to see sometimes how they can become incorporated into the genome. They seem like they're fleeting and ephemeral, but basically at the end of the day, Behavioral traits seem to have, to the extent that we can look at the degree to which they're affected by genes, have the same heritability as morphological or physiological traits. And there was an interesting study quite a few years ago in animal behavior that uh, uh, pointed this out. Well, I want to combine that idea that behavior evolves just like everything else. And that is incidentally kind of one of the things behind the new book. Um, um, it's about, you know, how we can use our thinking about the evolution of behavior to maybe get over a lot of these tiresome arguments about, you know, oh, there's a gene for dog ownership or, or whatever. But I want to combine that with another longstanding interest of mine, which is how new traits get established in populations. And of course, that's been a, a question for as long as we've understood about evolution. It was something that Darwin was interested in. Um, and so what I mean by a novel trait, people to argue about this, and it can be certainly controversial, um, but uh, what I want to suggest is that, I, so I'm just going to go by um, a very classic definition from Ernst Meyer from 1960, that a novel trait is any newly acquired structure or property that permits the assumption of a new function. So we're just going to go with that one. Certainly mutation is always the source of new material. So, you know, mutants arise and they either survive or get wiped out um, using selection as kind of a sieve for those. And so some new traits, some mutations die out and other ones spread. Well, what determines which ones spread? Um, I'd like to suggest that at least for some traits, what determines whether or not they spread is behavior. So behavior is often viewed as sometimes a pacemaker or a gatekeeper. People have used Duckworth is calling it a pacemaker for some time. And I think that this idea that behavior can regulate which traits get established and which don't ties this idea of novelty in with our understanding of the rate of evolution. And so this is basically the outline for the talk where I'm going to spend the rest of the time talking about two examples and really most of the rest of the time talking about one example, which is the work that we've been doing in my lab for the past many years. Um, I'm just adding another example because I think it's cool and because I wanna point out that this isn't just confined to my research. So the first example is adaptive signal loss in crickets, which as I said, I've been working on for quite some time. And so that's work out of my lab. And then the other one is um, work from uh, Tracy Langhild at um, Penn State University who's been interested in uh, anti-predator behavior and uh, novel um, uh, um, uh, anti-predator behavior in um, uh, fence lizards in North America. Okay, so the first example is with um, the Pacific field cricket, uh, Telia gorillus oceanicus. Um, and so, so, the, so I'm, I'm going to underscore this because I always feel like when, as the talk goes on, people start getting nervous that really all, all, most of the talk is going to be about this. I've just got a tiny bit at the end about the lizard. So if you start panicking because you feel like, oh my God, she's been talking for 40 minutes and she's still talking about the crickets. It's okay. I know. So, so don't, don't worry. Just, just pointing that out. Okay. Um, so the, um, so the cricket is native to Australia and the Pacific islands, places like Fiji, Tahiti, Samoa. Um, it was introduced to Hawaii by people. And in Hawaii, but only in Hawaii, it's parasitized by an acoustically orienting parasitoid fly. So an, by acoustically orienting, what I mean is that the fly is attracted to a call that the male crickets produce to, uh, to attract females. And so what that means is that you have a conflict between sexual selection, which favors the evolution and exaggeration of the sexual signal, the call, and natural selection, which obviously means that 
producing that call exposes the male to um, a deadly parasitoid. And I'll show you that in more detail in a second. So this kind of conflict between sexual and natural selection has been interesting to biologists ever since Darwin, because it means that traits don't evolve simply through one or the other process. And so this just shows you um, a photograph of the cricket uh, next, to, um, uh, next, to, uh, next to the fly so that you can get an idea of the relative size. Um, and here's some details about how the life cycle of the fly and uh, cricket work. So the idea is that the female fly, um, they're um, or, um, tachinids in the tribe Armenii, um, which are all parasitoids. And in this case, the fly is able to locate the cricket by his call. When she finds a cricket, she then flies close to him and deposits free living larvae. So she's not inserting eggs, she's just kind of dive bombing and dropping these very tiny larvae on him. And the, um, this is a, um, a first stage larva called a planidia. And uh, this is a human hair just for, for scale. So they're very small, they're one, two millimeters. The larvae then develop inside the host. And here you see, a, um, while the host is still alive, and here you see a um, cricket that I've dissected. He's lying on his back. This is his head over on this end um, and uh, uh, his uh, rear end over here. And all of these blobs are larvae of the fly that have grown up inside the cricket. Um, again, like I said, uh, well, a former student of mine used to call it uh, eating all the gooey bits um, while he's still alive. At the end of about seven to 10 days, the larva then um, emerges from the host, pupates in the soil, and at that point results in the death of the cricket and um, then the fly completes its life cycle. And so obviously what this sets up is this conflict for the males between calling, which is obviously a great thing because it attracts females, but calling because it's a terrible thing because it attracts this you know, horrible alien-like um, parasitoid. And so a lot of my research over the last couple of decades now has been trying to understand what the consequences are of this kind of signal exploitation as it's referred to. So I'm gonna give you some background from some older work first and then talk about um, stuff that we've done more recently, which gets into the adaptive signal loss. But initially, um, throughout the 1990s, I, um, I was monitoring this and um, we noticed that um, the rates of infestation in Hawaii um, of the uh, crickets with the uh, parasitoid varied among the islands and they were also relatively stable. We find the cricket and the fly on three islands in Hawaii. Kauai, the island of Oahu, and the big island of Hawaii, um, where we work mainly in Hilo, which is a town over here on the wet side, um, the windward side of the island. And we found um, through a lot of sampling that Oahu had the lowest proportion of infested um, crickets uh, with Hilo in the middle and Kauai um, having um, nearly a third of males that harbored these larvae. And so our first question way back when we were starting to do this was to try and understand whether the parasitoid itself, whether the presence of this conflicting selection had driven the evolution of the signal. And to try to understand that, we compared songs that we had recorded from, at that point, we only, um, when I was uh, doing this study, we had songs from one site in Hawaii um, on Hilo on the Big Island from Morea, which is an island in the Pacific near Tahiti and where there are no flies, um, and Australia, which is not an island, but also a place in the natural range of the cricket and also has no flies. And we just asked the question whether song from the parasitized population was different from song in the unparasitized populations, which would be a hint that indeed the parasitoid was driving the evolution of the signal. Um, to explain this a little better, I'm just going to give you a brief um, introduction about how crickets call. Um, and, and here's where I'm really sorry to be on Zoom because I always give what I joke with my students is the international symbol of crickets calling, um, which is that they rub their wings together. And I always do that with my two hands, um, showing that one of them is kind of uh, crossing the other one. But you'll have to imagine that for yourself. Um, the idea is that um, the crickets are opening and closing their wings. 
and a structure on the back side of one wing rubs against a structure on the upper surface of the opposite wing. And by doing that, it's kind of like you were running your uh, fingernail across the teeth of a comb. So it makes kind of a brr, brr noise. And the duration and how fast, so how fast and how often those wing closures happen is what determines what cricket song sounds like. And so it's very temporally simple compared to, I don't know if anybody's ever looked at bird song, for instance, but bird song's really complex. It's got all these harmonics and frequency modulation and all this other stuff. Um, cricket call is, crickets call, cricket calls are much simpler than that. And virtually all of the variation is temporal. So um, what we're able to do then is to put cricket calls into um, obviously a sound analysis package um, and understand variation at a variety of scales and measure a lot of things about them. So what I'm showing you here is a visual representation of um, Teleogrillus oceanicus song, which has two components to it, a long chirp that has anywhere from three to nine pulses or wing closures, which you see at the beginning, followed by a series of two pulse chirps, doublets, that, um, uh, that always occur in pairs and then the whole thing starts again. And so that's a little bit more complex than some cricket songs. So I'm gonna play it for you because um, we've just finally managed to conquer, I hope we finally managed to conquer the uh, technology and this should work. And so what you're gonna hear is that it's kind of syncopated and it kind of goes So let's see if that'll work. Hopefully that worked. You can hear this. Okay, cool. Um, so what we're able to do then is to measure the duration um, and the spacing of all of those components in the song. So we've got, for instance, the pulse duration and the interpulse interval, which is the, the space between the pulses within the long chirp. The same thing within the short chirps, the duration of the chirps, the inner chirp interval, and a few other characteristics that we're able to um, uh, quantify in songs from males that we record in the field from all those different populations. And so what we did to answer the question of, you know, okay, so is the parasitized population different is to take all of those recordings um, and then collapse the songs from each individual male into a single unit using a canonical discrimination, um, a canonical discriminant analysis, which um, basically just, like I said, collapses the variation so that you end up with a kind of hyperspace that describes the songs for each individual cricket. And I'm representing that here with a dot. Um, and so we've got, uh, so it represents the populations along two axes, because you always have one fewer axis than the number of populations you're looking at. And here, like I said, we're looking at two unparasitized populations from Morea and Kununura, which is the site in Australia, and one parasitized population in Hilo, Hawaii. And so we're asking, do you end up with song clouds in this hyperspace that um, correspond to the populations, which suggests that indeed they're able to be separated on the basis of song, or do you end up with this complete mixture? And from the um, figure, you can see that indeed they're separable. And this first axis does a pretty good job of separating the parasitized population, the one in um, uh, Hilo, from the two unparasitized populations in Morea and Kununura. Um, so indeed, it really looks like the parasitized population is different and you get a highly significant uh, discrimination um, uh, by using this technique. The second axis sort of discriminates between island Morea and uh, uh, Hawaii populations from the mainland population, although that dis discrimination is not as strong. So in other words, this really seems like it, it corroborates the idea that something's going on with the Hawaiian population that's different than what's happening to these others, because in addition to this, the distance from the centroid of the points uh, in Hawaii is much greater, uh, uh, it's, the distance is much greater from Hawaii to either of these other two than the other two are to each other, even though of course Morea and Kununura have no reason to be similar to each other. So it looks like something's going on with the parasitized population. 
Well, okay, but then is it really the parasitoid or is it what you might, for lack of a better word, refer to as geography? In other words, we've got two things that are, or we've got two things that are more similar to each other than either of them is to a third thing, but that could happen for a variety of reasons that have nothing to do with the parasitoid. They might just have to do with the fact that, you know, there's other differences from place to place. Um, you know, the habitat is different, predators are different, there's different competitors and so forth. So what we really want to do is zero in on this and say how much variation is due to alternative causes and not to the parasitoid itself. Well, to answer this question, by this point in our research, we'd gotten to, um, we'd gotten to sample crickets from the other two islands in Hawaii that I mentioned, Kauai and Oahu. And if you recall, all three of those places had stable but very different proportions of males that were infested by the cricket. And so using that information, we should be able to use this result essentially as a hypothesis generator and to say, all right, so if this result arose because of differences in parasitoid prevalence, then we should be able to make predictions about new populations and where those new populations should fall out on this hyperspace that we've created with the analysis. In other words, if we take a new sample from Hilo, it should fall where the other sample from Hilo fell. I mean, that's not really a surprise. But if we take a sample from Kauai, which is from a population that's more heavily parasitized and hence more likely to have experienced stronger selection from the uh, parasitoid than Hilo, its calls should fall out further along in this direction along the axis because of the nature of the uh, selection. And um, similarly, the Oahu sample, which has a lower infestation rate, should be closer to the unparasitized populations because selection will have been weaker. So that's what we did is test how robust that hypothesis was by looking at these new populations. And to do that, we did um, uh, another uh, multivariate analysis called a canonical uh, correlation analysis, where we're basically saying, here are the predicted song characteristics, depending on how parasitized you are. Here are the actual song characteristics. What's the correspondence between them? And it turns out that the correspondence is actually rather strong and highly significant. And furthermore, that the, that the parasitoid hypothesis alone accounts for more than 20% of all the variation in song structure, which I think is pretty good, given that, um, you know, obviously there's lots of other things that, that influence um, song evolution. So it really does look like these conflicting selection is affecting the evolution of the signal. And at the same time, and so we spent actually a lot of the ensuing decade or so um, understanding some of the ways in which both the behavior and the song structure of the crickets had changed. And we were able to, to, to hone in on exactly which song characteristics were the ones that the um, parasitoid seem to um, use in finding its host, and hence to construct um, a selection surface by, um, this is just the result of a binomial regression where you say, okay, here's the probability of being parasitized either zero or one, what song characteristics does that depend on? And it turns out that the most important song characteristics are the long chirp interpulse interval. So the longer that the interpulse interval is between the, um, the uh, pulses in that, that long chirp, that first series of, of pulses. So the longer it is, the less likely you are to be parasitized. The shorter it is, the more likely you are to be parasitized. Similarly, the longer the long chirp duration, the, the more likely you are to be parasitized. And so in effect, you can think of this as a selection gradient where Ormia, the fly, is pushing the male crickets down this slope in the selection they exert on the call. Well, okay, so that certainly makes it seem like if I were a cricket and didn't want to get parasitized, I should call like this. So why don't they all call like this? The answer, as you can probably guess, 
is that there is a counter sexual selection gradient that's acting in the opposite direction. Because work in my lab, along with work in the lab of a couple of other people, has shown that female Teleogrillus oceanicus prefer and are more attracted to males that have longer long chirp duration. And so they're actually sort of going back and forth in this sort of push me pull you where anything that males do that makes them less attractive to flies also makes them less attractive to females and vice versa. So this is a cruel bind for the males and how are they gonna get out of it? Again, we spent some time um, exploring ways that males um, uh, have apparently experienced selection to get out of it. And I won't be able to go into any of that here, but the thing that happened um, that was probably the most dramatic and that we've been focusing a lot of our attention on for quite a while now is that um, we got to witness um, an event of extremely rapid evolution um, first on the island of Kauai that resulted um, uh, in the, uh, a much more abrupt change to the sexual signal than certainly we had been imagining. So just to give you a little bit of the history of this, um, so while we were working on Kauai, crickets just became more and more scarce and um, they, uh, we just weren't having as much luck finding them when we were going to collect individuals for our lab colony. And in 2001, when we went there, we only heard a single male calling. Um, we found, I, I'm, I've been collecting females for my lab colonies to replenish them um, for a long time. And I, it was really like, we were really scraping the grass to get at any. Um, and I thought, you know, this is just a dynamic system and they're gonna go away and that's it. Um, and in 2003, I actually didn't hear any crickets at all, but you know, and we skipped 2002 entirely. But you know, you figure you may as well get out of the car. Um, and so we left the car and I you know, was walking at night with my headlamp and going up the place where you ordinarily see them. And all of a sudden in my um, headlamp, I started seeing um, uh, all of these crickets, but I wasn't hearing anything. And so I, I don't know, I don't think probably anybody in the audience is a, um, a, like a cricket person, but if you're a cricket person, then you will understand that I experienced um, what the psychologists call cognitive dissonance during this time. Um, because my brain was telling me something that my sense organs were telling me was not possible. Namely, that if you're out at night and you're seeing a bunch of crickets, you should be hearing crickets. And I was used to hearing crickets because I work on crickets. But uh, conversely, if you're not hearing any crickets, then there shouldn't be any crickets. So I spend a while, and I'm, I'm kind of embarrassed to say this, although I've now told it to enough people, I'm probably not embarrassed anymore. But um, like I was literally picking them up and saying, oh my God, what are these? And of course, I've been working on them for like years. I know what they are. They're the same kind of crickets I've been working on forever but nobody was making any noise. And so that didn't seem possible. So then I pick up another one. A anyway, I, 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 I'm not gonna dwell on this because I'm kind of not proud of it. Um, but eventually what emerged is that what had happened in the space of a very short period on Kauai is that there was a wing mutation that had spread which makes the males unable to call. Um, we call the uh, bearers of the mutation flat wings because they lack the stridulatory apparatus that um, I referred to before that allows males to produce their call. So it's not that they're behaviorally refraining from it, it's that they cannot produce the song. Um, they're protected from the fly because the fly can't find them if they don't produce the song. And work um, uh, mostly by a um, former PhD student and now a um, associate professor at the University of Denver, Rob, Denver Robin Tingatella, showed that this is uh, due to a single sex link gene. The change was extraordinarily rapid. It occurred in fewer than 20 generations, which is of course a very um, uh, rapid evolutionary response. It was originally on Kauai and then on the island of Oahu. At this point, we're seeing like sort of up and down on the big island where sometimes we go and there's quite a few um, you know, like a couple of percent uh, of the males are calling, or sorry, are uh, flat wings, and then the next time fewer, and then the next time a couple more. So it's, it's been bobbing up and down. But we've got about almost all of the males on Kauai. And actually, I should update this because we were finally able to go back last year. And I, I'm, I'm not going to say for sure, but I'm, I think it may be fixed on Kauai, which I think may mean that it's going to go away, or that the crickets are going to go away completely. We can talk about that later if anybody's interested. But anyway, the upshot is that we've seen an adaptive loss of a male signal. 
So just to give you a better look at it, if, in case anyone wants to see the structure. So that file that I was saying, you know, it's like the teeth of a comb. Um, this is what it looks like through the uh, uh, scanning electron uh, micrograph. And this is what a normal male wing looks like. Um, this is what a female wing looks like because they can't call at all. There's also these structures called the harp and the mirror that serve as resonating structures on the wing. The flat wings don't have any of these. They look from the outside sort of like they're a, a female, but um, they're a completely intact and normal, otherwise physiologically and anatomically male. Um, so we have um, uh, a mutant that is morphologically very distinct, um, but it absolutely is a normal male in other respects. Okay, so this led to, well, led to a whole lot of stuff, but what I wanna concentrate on here is so now that we, you know, we've had this change, how, this is great from the standpoint of avoiding the fly, because like I said, the fly cannot find the crickets if the crickets aren't calling. They can't use any other um, sensory modality. So, what about the other half of the equation, namely how a flat wing is going to get any females to mate with him? Now, it's even more complicated than I suggested at first because crickets produce two kinds of song. There's the calling song, which is the one I played for you and which is the long range attraction song that gets females in from a distance. And then once the female has been, um, once the female's been uh, brought in, when the male and female contact each other, the male produces a courtship song, a short range song, which um, is structurally different and which, you know, everybody says, you know, kind of conventional cricket wisdom says is necessary in order for the uh, mating to happen and for the female to go ahead and accept a spermatophor. So we really have two, or well, we, the males really have two problems. One of them is how males and females find each other to begin with. And the other one is why females are going to be accepting a male that can't produce this courtship song. So for the first part, we started wondering whether the flat wings might be acting as satellites. Um, probably most of you know that in a lot of animals, including some crickets, there are males that don't signal. Um, instead, um, they intercept females that are attracted to the callers or they hang around the territories of territorial males and so forth. And so what we wondered was whether the flat wings were attracted to these few remaining callers, and there have always been a few callers that remain, and that would increase their likelihood of um, uh, encountering a female. To test this, we did a really simple field experiment um, in which we just flagged out on all three of the islands. And, and at this point, let me emphasize that um, we'd only found the flat wings on, um, uh, on Kauai, so we, we hadn't really uh, found any on Oahu at this point. And we just flagged out two meter radius circles. We took all the crickets out, did a playback. And then after 20 minutes, we saw who had been attracted to the playback. And it turns out that on Kauai, the flat wings were much more attracted to the playback and settled much closer to the speaker than the normal wings on either island and on, um, on, on any of the uh, other islands. And uh, for the first time, we actually found flat wings on Oahu um, where there were just four of them, but they too were located closer to the speaker than the normal wing males um, uh, were on um, both Oahu and uh, the big island. So this is just distance from the speaker. So, they, so the normal wing males were about 125 centimeters. The flat wings were 75 and the number of crickets that we collected afterwards, after we did the playback, was much higher than the number we'd collected beforehand on Kauai um, than it was on either of the other two islands. So the flat wings were really doing something different. Okay, so hang on to that because I'll come back to it later. But right now, I want to turn to the female, um, to the courtship song and the female acceptance part of the equation and ask why females are gonna mate with males that don't produce a courtship song. Here, we wondered whether choosiness had already become relaxed and behavioral plasticity was greater in island populations. And this is um, stemming from a, um, an idea that Ken Kaneshiro, um, a uh, um, biologist who worked in Hawaii on uh, insects for a long time had come up with, which is that if you're part of a founding population that was quite small, which is going to be the case on most islands, 
then extremely choosy females are going to be at a disadvantage because they simply won't find a male that satisfies whatever their criteria are. And so they, along with their genes for being picky, are gonna die out. On the contrary, if you're kind of loose about your preferences, then you're going to find a male that you, that you will mate with. And hence, your um, lack of discrimination is going to persist in the island population. And thus, we'd expect ancestral females to discriminate against derived males, but derived males would accept ancestral males because they're just not as picky. And if that's going on, then that would have facilitated the establishment of the flat wings because we've already got this plasticity in who you're going to accept in terms of whether or not they produce a courtship song. To test this idea, um, Robin Tingatella um, and I um, sampled populations from across the Cricket's range. We had uh, two islands, and again, at this point, only um, Kauai had uh, flat wings, but we did Kauai and Oahu. We did two islands, which nonetheless did not have, um, uh, which of course don't have the, uh, the parasitoids, but they're still islands, and two mainland sites, Carnarvon and Mission Beach, um, both on opposite sides of Australia, um, so mainland populations. And then we, and here by we, I mainly mean Robin, um, observed interactions with all of the possible combinations with males and females from each of the six pot, from each of the six places where we collected crickets, and then just looked at who mated, um, how long it took the male to uh, do a courtship song, whether or not the mating was successful, and so forth. And this schematic shows you um, kind of uh, roughly what our results were. So the darker the color, the higher the proportion of females that accepted a male for mating. And the blue is uh, island populations and the orange is the mainland populations. And so there's two things to notice here. One of them is, uh, so K is Kauai. One of them is that kind of no one wants to mate with males from Kauai. Even females from Kauai would rather mate with males from another population. The second thing to notice, so, so you know, not producing a song really is a little, it's not a deal breaker, but it's certainly a deal weakener. Um, and then the second thing to notice is that by and large, Mission Beach and Carnarvon, those two mainland populations are pickier than the island populations. And that's shown a little bit better here where um, the y-axis is the proportion of females that went ahead and mated in this in, uh, experiment. And all of the island populations, including Moray and Samoa, where certainly, you know, the, there's never been flat wings, there's never been, um, there's never been, uh, uh, there's never been the flies. So, but even so, they're more likely to mate with a flat wing than females from a mainland population, which suggests that indeed what we have is this pre-existing behavioral plasticity. Okay, so what we're wondering then is whether behavior itself was able to facilitate the rapid evolution and the establishment of this mutation. And this idea just suggests that, okay, what if crickets already have what you might call a rule of thumb about how you respond to a world that has become, and this is what's happened with the flat wings, it's become quiet. There's no callers there. Well, you could get a quiet world if you're a cricket because you're in a crummy habitat or because there's been a storm that's wiped out everybody or whatever. If you already have a pre-existing response that says, when I don't hear very many males, I should do thing X, that might allow the flat wings to flourish simply because they're kind of slotting into this pre-existing plasticity. So to test this, we've done a lot of experiments over the years examining the role of the acoustic environment of the crickets in shaping their later behavior. And this is work that was spearheaded by Nathan Bailey, a former postdoc of mine, who's now on the faculty at the University of St. Andrews in Scotland. And he's found that, or well, so, so let me back up a little bit. So what we thought is that, okay, if crickets are using the sound environment as a cue to what they're gonna do later on, if we rear crickets in incubators, which is schematically uh, shown here, with and without song, we're gonna be able to replicate either an environment with a lot of flat wings or an environment that's relatively normal. 
And we found that indeed what happens is that males are um, uh, more likely to respond to calling song themselves and hence we think more likely to be um, satellites if they're reared in silence. So here you see how long they're spending near a speaker in a playback after they've been reared without song or with song. And if they've been reared without song, they spend longer. That difference, so we did this with both younger and older males and that difference gets even gets exaggerated when the males are older, which again speaks to this idea that experience influences this likelihood of becoming um, a satellite, which again, I think will favor the uh, establishment of the flat wings because it'll enable them to get some mating success. Females also respond to um, being reared in environments with and without song. So they'll move, um, uh, so if they're reared without song, they'll move closer to a speaker that's playing, uh, that's playing playback and they also, or that's playing cricket song. And they also will show, um, they'll be more discriminating if they've been reared with song. So these light bars here show their response times and they've got a markedly reduced response time if they've been reared with song. But if they've been reared without song, they don't really care what percentage of long chirp the song model has, they'll just go to anybody. So the upshot is that how you're reared can influence how you're gonna behave later. And I think that kind of plasticity has influenced the way that, um, has influenced the way that the flat wings have been able to become established. All right, more recently, um, and this is the last chunk of work on the, the crickets that I'm gonna talk about. Um, more recently, we've looked at kind of the, the balance between advantages and disadvantages to holding, to, to harboring the flat wing gene itself or allele itself. Now it spread really rapidly. And though, and this is work from Justa Hein and Kay, who was a postdoc in my lab, um, uh, up until last year. And um, this gene uh, spread really rapidly and it's clearly beneficial for male survival. But the normal wings remain on both Kauai and Oahu. At the same time, if you had 100% flat wings, well, they can't use a satellite behavior because satellites aren't, um, a, you, know, you have to have something to be a satellite of. So, how does the flat wing allele affect other traits that might then influence the dynamics of sexual signal loss? Um, and here, what we wanted to explore was how females might be influenced by carrying this um, allele on their X chromosome. So cricket sex determination is it's XXXO. So males only have one copy, females have two copies of the X chromosome. And what that means is that females always look um, the same, whether or not they're heterozygous or homozygous, but males look either like flat wings because they'll have one allele from the flat wing, one flat wing allele, or, or they'll be normal because they lack, they lack that allele and they have a normal allele. Um, and what that means is that we can imagine how flat wings might have, how carrying the flat wing allele might affect female behavior. So for example, if the flat wing allele is associated with females being more permissive in their mating behavior and with greater reproductive success of the flat wing allele or of individuals carrying the flat wing allele, then that favors the spread of that signal loss. On the other hand, if they're more discriminating and they have reduced reproductive success, then that would hinder the spread of the signal loss. So to explore this, we established um, uh, true breeding lines of homozygous flat wing and normal wing females. And this slide is, you're not supposed to read this because we did, it's a regular Mendelian breeding design. It took a while to get organized, but this, you know, hopefully the sight of all of these containers of crickets reassures you that we did it. Um, and so I'm not gonna go into the details here, but we, we did do it. Um, and so we wanted to look at the degree to which females that carry the allele differ in their mating behavior. So we looked at females that did or didn't have the flat wing allele. We looked at their attraction to calling song. We looked at how choosy they were during mating encounters. And here we either played courtship song back during the encounter or we didn't and looked at whether the female mounted the male. 
And so I'm gonna show you the results. It's slightly complicated. So I just wanna orient you to the figures. So what we're gonna look at is the percent of females that mounted the male that indicate she's accepting him to mate over here on the Y axis. And then we've got females with the normal wing allele and females with the flat wing allele. And here, song and silence refer to whether we played a, a courtship song or not um, during, the, um, uh, during the trial. And so you can see that um, uh, first of all, everybody's more, um, everybody's less interested as it were in, in mating with um, uh, males when there's no courtship song. So if, you're, if the song is being played in these pink bars, the bars are generally higher. At the same time, the flat wing females are less um, likely to mate than the normal wing females, which was not something that we were expecting. And so the difference between these two is significant. So female genotype has, an, has a, um, a significant effect. So, the mo so in, and in general, if you have a normal wing female um, who's hearing courtship song, she'll mate almost 100% of the time. The least likely to mate is a flat wing carrying female who's experiencing no courtship song. So there's an interaction between morph and um, uh, sort of the, the uh, uh, experience, the acoustic experience they're having at the time. And so what that suggests to us is that there's kind of a complicated, like I said, sort of this push me, pull you thing that's going on at the same time. And then finally, we found out from counting, just basically doing a really simple test by counting offspring that um, were the result of uh, males that differed in whether or not they had uh, normal or flat wing uh, alleles. We gave them acoustic rearing treatments. We looked at their agent mating and then just wanted to say, okay, what else does pairing the flat wing allele do to you? And it turned out that much to our surprise, flat wing males sire 12% more offspring than normal wing males do. Um, we're still working, we're, look, we're doing some collaborative work um, with Lee Simmons lab in Australia to try and see whether there are differences in accessory protein gene expression um, that uh, might influence the degree to which fertilization takes place. But in the meantime, this is giving those flat wings just a little bit of an advantage. Um, there wasn't any experience, by the way, of acoustic experience or age. So overall then, what we have is that the flat wing allele is associated with greater offspring production for males per mating event, which is gonna favor the spread of flat wings, but with choosier females that seem to not mate with males that carry um, the allele that they carry. Uh, and that's gonna hinder the spread of the flat wings. And I think that put together, those suggest that what we've got is something that's um, allowing the uh, polymorphism to be maintained through the existence of behavior. Okay, so now just a couple of slides about this other example, just because I think it's really cool and because I think it provides a different perspective on the same kind of point I'm trying to make um, uh, in the rest of the talk. And this is that, um, and this is an example, like I said, from Tracy Lankill's lab, uh, who's been, and she's been studying fire ants, um, Solenopsis invicta, which have been spreading, as you probably know, in North America. They attack, uh, well, people, but also um, uh, vertebrates um, in very large swarms, um, and she's been working on their effects on eastern fence li lizards, Scoloporus undulatus, which co-occur with fire ants. And she's found that lizards from populations that have a longer history of exposure to fire ants are more likely to show these defensive behaviors um, like uh, body twitching and fleeing. And I'm going to show you those here. Come on. Well, that was a twitch, but it wasn't a very good flea. There you go. Um, then um, uh, populations that are are naive to the to the um, to the fire ants, and those behaviors turn out to be extremely effective in deterring the ants. But the behaviors are already present. However, the novel situation of the so so the hatchlings are more likely to are, are likely to exhibit those escape behaviors. But what's happened is that the novel situation of having the fire ants present has provided a new selective force, um, which in turn 
has meant that selection for longer limbs has occurred, which helps with the escape. And then the adults and hatchlings from the sites that were invaded longer ago also have relatively longer limbs. So, so there's been this very close connection between behavior and, um, uh, and selection and morphology that's resulted in a change that I think couldn't have happened with morphology alone or behavior alone. Oh, sorry, and this just shows you that the relative high, how the relative hind limb length has increased since the invasion of the uh, fire ants. Okay, um, most recently, I just thought this was a really cool paper and wanted to mention it. Um, if you have fire ant juvenile, fire ant naive juvenile lizards, so ones that have never experienced fire ants, they will change their behavior so that they flee from fire ants after one encounter. And what Robertson and um, Robinson uh, Langfield suggest in this paper is that this may be an example of what's often referred to as phenotypic accommodation, where the idea is that if you have a particular kind of behavior, then those rapid plastic responses can basically rescue a population um, than ones that uh, would have a slower response. Okay, so what I think then is that behavior really does act as this gatekeeper for an evolutionary process. And this is sort of the, you know, an adult, you know, the ultimate example of phenotypic plasticity, where we're more likely to be in, where behavior is more likely to be involved in adaptation to a novel selective pressure simply because it is so plastic. And I, I really like the idea that behavioral traits can integrate things that you're seeing with morphology, physiology, and so forth. And I think that in thinking about novelty and the rate at which novel traits are established in animals, at least, I think that, that talking about, um, uh, that talking about the rate of evolution as being regulated by behavior is a really interesting direction to go. So um, hopefully I've shown you that um, sexual signals can change a lot under conflicting selection pressure and that behavior can be a powerful force in as is often called the mode and tempo of evolution. Um, I do think that there's lot, there are lots of examples of behavior facilitating evolution. Um, I've given you two. And I also think that life history related behaviors are important. And something else that's important to remember is that if you don't have this kind of behavioral scaffolding for new adaptations, then those new traits, the mutations could disappear very rapidly. Um, finally, I just want to acknowledge um, lots of people have worked on this over the years. John Rotenberry, my husband, um, has, he's really a bird person and has been dragged long suffering to Hawaii and places like that. Um, uh, Robin Tingatella, like I said, is now at the University of Denver and is doing really cool work on Tilly Gorillas that she's discovered yet a new morph that do what she calls purring um, on the island of Molokai. Um, this is Tracy uh, Langhild. Um, Nathan Bailey's done a lot of this work as well. Uh, and um, I've had lots of other postdocs, graduate students. Um, it, it's funny, this is a picture from a couple of years ago of my lab group. And um, I have to say that when I first put this in the slide, I, I, I had this recoil where I thought, oh my God, why are all those people standing so close together not wearing masks? Um, and so, um, yes, well, sign of the times. Um, so hopefully we'll be back to being able to stand together and doing that pretty soon uh, um, as well. So um, anyway, thanks uh, again to all of you and I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Marlene, for a wonderful presentation. Lots of interesting things I'm sure to discuss. And uh, one more time, just to get us into the, the modus operandi of the seminar and the question and answer, I now invite you to type a question mark. That's all you need to do, unless you feel like your internet connection is not reliable. And if you, want, if you need to write the question, please do but we prefer if you can, that you just pose the question yourself. And I'll be calling you in the order in which you type the question mark in the chatting window. Very much, we wanna encourage the students, our young colleagues to join us and go ahead with questions. So if you're a senior researcher, I may skip over your name, 
and just go on to one of our younger colleagues. Uh, we'll try to get everyone, we have an hour, so please, uh, we're ready to take the first question, which is coming now from Michael Ryan. Michael, oh, and before I forget, it's always just, just to continue building our fine community, please take a second to indicate where you're joining us from, both your country. I mean, it's quite remarkable the number of people we have from coming, joining us from all over the world. So both your country and institution where you're affiliated. Michael? Hi, I'm, university, I'm at University of Texas in Texas, USA. And uh, Marlene, thanks so much for this talk. Every chapter of this research just makes it so much more, more and more and more interesting. But I have a question that's a little bit out of uh, the wheelhouse of this research. So, you know, there's obviously there's no question that these courtship traits are really important in mate choice and species recognition, et cetera. But for some taxa, at least, they're also really important for initiating or at least facilitating the female's reproductive physiology. So, you know, if you think of this classic work by Learman, if those males couldn't bow coup, you think, well, there's just no reproduction that's going to take place. And we know that that's true for, you know, for other birds, for frogs. But is there anything known about how the, uh, the uh, calls of the cricket influence the female's uh, reproductive physiology? Yeah, so we don't know. So uh, to my knowledge, the call doesn't influence reproductive physiology. But one thing that's very important is um, the accessory proteins in the spermatophore. So it's, it, in other words, so, so the subtitle of what you just said is it's not just the sperm. Um, and so, which is certainly true in the crickets, it seems to not just be the, um, it's not just the sperm either in that there's um, prostaglandins and other compounds in the, um, in the spermatophore that increase fecundity of the, um, that increase fecundity of the, uh, of the females. To my knowledge, I don't know if anybody's ever looked at, like if you raised a female without her ever hearing courtship, that's an interesting song. If you ra raised a female without her ever hearing calling song, would she, like, would her ovarian development proceed normally? And I don't know if anybody's ever answered that. It would surprise me if no one has looked at that, but I don't know for sure. Thank you. Next question is from Kaya Tombak. Kaya. Hi, thank you so much for the great talk. I'm uh, Kaya Tombak. I'm a postdoc at Hunter College in the US. Um, and I wanted to know whether um, female choice in this context could be reframed more in terms of strategy um, on the female side, going beyond sort of um, attraction to sort of males that might be advertising some kind of strength um, since you have these females reared in different environments, would you, would you take your results to mean that if they're reared in silence, maybe there's a sort of frequency dependent female choice where they, their sons might then be deemed to be less likely to compete against normal males. And so maybe, you know, in that case, it might be strategic to, um, you know what I'm saying, to, to, to mate um, more with flat wing nails. Yeah, so the idea of like, well, yeah, I do get, that's a super cool idea. Um, so the idea to which it's sort of, as you say, strategic to, you know, mate with some males and not others is, I, I, is something that we've thought about. One thing that to me hinders my, my thinking, oh yeah, that could work, is that I think there's a concern. So if, if there if there's not very many males out there, then there's also the consideration that you should mate with anybody you can, just so you can have some, just so you can have your eggs fertilized, right? And so I feel like there's there's going to be these conflicting pressures, and I would be, I think it would be a big gamble for a female to mate with a because people have asked me this before, and they say, oh, but shouldn't she like? go ahead and mate with a flat wing. Cause then if she went ahead and mated with a flat wing, then it would actually potentially be advantageous because she'd have offspring that would not get parasitized by the fly. And I feel like that's asking a lot of the male or sorry of the female, 
because remember she's a cricket and like buried very deep in in sort of cricketness is responding to male calls that's just what you do as a cricket and i think it's almost asking her to not be a cricket to suggest that she respond to something that's so counter to the way crickets are i feel like i'm not being very articulate about it but so, so I guess what I'm saying is I, I see what you mean, but I feel like trying to respond in that fine tuned a way might be asking for more than crickets are capable of. Or as I often tell my students who seem to get themselves tied up in knots coming up with hypotheses is remember, they're just crickets. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, I guess what I'm feeling is that the our perception of the what makes a cricket is a cricket that is usually reared in a noisy environment with lots of cricket calls. And so I guess, I mean, it, it's, I, you it's know, hard you to know where I, Yeah, I, no, I see what you're saying. You know where, where it might come out is in the, and, and I've toyed with doing this and we never have of uh, rearing them in different densities and saying, because there's one thing of saying, okay, I've been reared in an environment that seems like it's completely like scorched earth and there's nobody here. And there's another in, say, in, in providing an environment that, sa that says in effect, well, there's some males here, but there aren't a lot of males here. And so maybe I should like, for instance, maybe I should be more likely to mate with multiple males rather than only mate with one and then go lay all my eggs. So I think that's maybe the level at which it might be adjusted. The next question is from Maren Hook. Maren? Hello, my name is Maren. I'm at the University of Derby. And I'm interested in knowing, and, and thanks for the great talk, um, I'm interesting, uh, interested in knowing the, the, the third side, which is the flies. So A, what did the flies do before the crickets arrived on these islands? So whom did they parasitize? And if, if on some of these islands, the, the flat wings are getting um, the majority, what what do they do now? Because I think only if you understand what the flies are doing, are you going to understand how the whole thing evolves? Yep, um, got it. Um, and I didn't have time to talk about the flies. So the flies are, are, are their own conundrum, as you say, it's sort of a third side of it. So first of all, the flies are also introduced. Um, the flies are native to uh, North America. I mean, there are, they also occur in South America, but, but the ones that are in Hawaii seem to have come from North America. We have no idea when or how the flies got to Hawaii. There are no other alternative hosts in Hawaii because there's no, because the flies have to parasitize a singing male insect. That's, that's their whole modus operandi. So they can't be there without the crickets. All the native Hawaiian crickets are really tiny and they're too small and their songs are in the wrong frequency range to, um, uh, to be heard by the fly. So I always, I, if, if you want, we could spend the whole rest of the time talking about how the flies got there. I don't know how the flies got there. Um, we know that the crickets have been there since at least, um, uh, what is it, 1872, I think there's a record, you know, somebody published a paper and said there's these crickets there. Um, but they're not, the crickets are not native to Hawaii. So the crickets came either on a ship or um, for a while I was kind of intrigued by the idea that they could have come with um, the Polynesians that colonized um, Hawaii back in you know, 1500, 2000 years ago. Um, and we've done a little bit of genetic work and I keep meaning to get back to it and have not. Um, uh, so the crickets have been there for at least you know, 150 years um, and possibly longer. How long have the flies been there? We have no idea. The flies are closely related to populations in North America and they're obligate parasitoids. So how did they get to Hawaii? I don't, my latest, I, I, I always tell people that I come up with these thoughts and or these, these scenarios and each one is like more unlikely than the one before, but one of them has to be true because they're there. And so my latest one is that the flies arrived on, um, uh, or the flies came in like turf grass, like, you know how like people um, ship, uh, you know, grass for growing lawns and so forth in these big rolls that include some soil. And so the flies pupate in the soil and the flies are in pretty high densities in parts of North America, like Florida and California. 
I don't know, maybe somebody was shipping turf grass and they got a bunch of flies. And I mean, it still seems really weird that they would have also gotten there at the exact same time that there are big populations of teleogrillus because that doesn't seem, I don't know, but they got there somehow. So that's answering part of it. Um, and then the other part of it, which is in these populations like on Kauai, where so far as I can tell, it's almost all flat wings. Um, what's, you know, how, how are the flies maintaining themselves? I don't know that either. All I can tell you is that every single time I've gone to um, uh, Kauai, except for this very last visit last August, you put out a sound trap and you get flies. What are they living on? I don't know, you just get flies. Um, this last time, like I said, I, I'm hoping we can go again this summer, but COVID's made it all really difficult. But basically I went to the same place I've been finding them for over 20 years and I found only flat wings. I, took, I collected females and reared the, reared the offspring from them. They're all flat wings. We may be witnessing the demise of the population. On the other hand, Robin's been there and she said she heard a male recently. So you got me. That was a super long winded way of saying I have no idea. Um, but it is, it is really interesting um, and Unfortunately, there are some, there are a lot of drawbacks to being able to answer, you know, to being able to work on the flies is really difficult. But yeah, I agree with you that they're a, they're a key component of all of this. The next question is from Logan Platt. Logan? Hi, I'm uh, Logan Platt. I'm a master's student at UTC in Tennessee, United States. Um, you kind of partially or kind of answered my question um, about the flies. I was going to ask, did you anticipate any um, evolutionary response like from the flies or have you seen any change in behavior from the flies? Do you still notice um, like situations where crickets are still being parasitized by them a lot or has that just kind of gone away almost entirely? The flies are super good at finding, like, so there's actually a whole other research direction that I'm not involved in, but that a bunch of other really wonderful scientists are um, trying to understand the neurophysiology of the flies, um, the flies behavior. The flies are actually better at finding male crickets than female crickets are. Um, and this is work, Ron Hoy at Cornell um, did a lot of this work. Uh, Andrew Mason, who's now at uh, University of Toronto Scarborough has done a lot of this work as well. And so their ears, well, let me backtrack. Their ears are um, basically like fly, like cricket ears on a fly body. So most crickets, uh, so crickets here with tympanal ears that are located on the legs or on the body. Um, uh, flies generally have sensory things on the antennae these flies, this whole group, the Ormeines, all have tympanal ears. They're located very close together. They're incredibly finely um, co-evolved with, um, with the cricket. And so I don't think there are very many shifts that would be particularly possible for them to make because I think they're, they're extraordinarily constrained. Actually, people are really interested in um, uh, some of the funding I know that uh, Ron Hoy's lab and some of his collaborators, there's also a, a, a lab in um, Switzerland that's been doing a bunch of work on them as well. And some of the people are interested in this uh, from the standpoint of uh, hearing aid development, because as you probably know, if people are hard of hearing, it's not just that they need the volume turned up, they often have um, trouble with uh, distinguishing sounds in noisy environments and in sound localization. And the way you localize sounds is by comparing what comes into both of your ears and, and in fact, so here, tip, um, if you ever wanna find crickets in the field, as of course you often do, like, or, or I mean, I often do, so I can't imagine that all of you don't. Um, what you do is um, as you're listening to them, you turn your head and then you can compare where the sound is louder and which ear it's coming into louder and you can localize the song, the song better that way. Um, but the weird thing is that the flies, of course, are smaller than the crickets. So their ears are closer together even than the crickets are. So why are they better at responding to the crickets? And so anyway, so, so I, I don't, I'm not a neurophysiologist, but a lot of people are really interested in this because it might actually provide some clues to um, the development of hearing aids, which is kind of extraordinary um, 
in all of this. But uh, if you, I, I, don't, I haven't looked for a while, but Andrew Mason used to have these awesome uh, videos on his website. Um, so if you look it up, he, 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 I used to say that he should have like a, one of these YouTube channels where it would be all flies all the time because he, he had flies like that were tethered onto like a moving, like a, you know, one of those, like what they used to have in an old fashioned computer mouse. Um, uh, on, tethered on a ball where they were running on it and there'd be a, a speaker from either side. Um, and then you could hear, um, and he'd do playback from one or the other speaker. And you would swear that the fly turned in the direction of the sound before you heard the sound. Cause they're that good. They're just remarkable at, at their sensitivity. Wow, that's cool. Thanks. My question is next, but I'd rather ask Lauren, do we have any questions from the YouTube channel or do we have anyone in the audience who hasn't asked a question? Hey, can I entice you to do so? If not, I have one. I don't see any in YouTube yet. Any of our younger colleagues who would like to pose a question now? Okay, then I'll ask. And I, I'll, Marlene, you were telling us at the beginning how you cannot do both the chatting and presenting. I have the same problem. I, when we host, I'm so anxious about everything going well that I may have missed and maybe my question you've already answered. But my impression from some of the data that you presented on the second half, primarily data that was originated through experiments, the playback experiments where you cleaned the two, two meter circle or some of the mating data at the end, it, what would what, what call my attention is that the differences among across the different treatments or situations was not really dramatic. And even the 12% increase in reproductive success, I'm trying to reconcile that with the disappearance of a trait in just 20 generations, because early in the talk, you were sharing how in only 20 generations, it, it disappeared. But, but, but of course, in one case, we're talking about the the natural setting, the other one is an experiment. But, but could, could you comment on, am I right in saying that the results from the experiments are, are difficult to reconcile with something that is gonna disappear in the field in only 20 generations? So no, I, I, I think it's really, it's super interesting to think about because I think what it does is underscore the, the sort of delicate nature of frequency dependence. Because basically what you have is Natural, so, so the minute that natural selection favors the flat wings persisting a lot, but then they get more prominent and sexual selection is so, you know, females would really, really, really to be anthropomorphic, rather mate with a normal wing male. And that advantage then pushes them up, which is happening at exactly the same time that they're being slammed by the fly which is also happening at the same time that the flat wings are engaging in, in satellite behavior where, okay, they're rejected a ton of the time, but they're accepted a little bit of the time and they can live so much longer. And so you've got all of this kind of, things are going up and down, you know, sort of dynamically all at, the, you know, all at once. When, when we first started doing this project long ago, I naively thought, oh, I'm gonna be able to, to model, it's, it's gonna be like the links in the hair and I'm gonna be able to model stable limit cycles. And it's gonna be, you know, like the links in the hair only like cooler because crickets and flies, like that's cooler. Um, and, and then my hopes were dashed because of course you need to know so many more of the other parameters to be able to do that. And so not really. I mean, we have done some modeling and, I, and I'm still really interested in, for example, how can you maintain and why do we maintain different proportions of flat wings and normal wings um, on the different islands and why have those been so stable? Um, and that's something that we've tried to attack um, theoretically, you know, just doing some pretty simple simulation modeling. Um, and I'm, I'm still quite interested in that. But I think, so I think the answer to your question is that just, you know, the minute one thing, one thing creeps up, something else is creeping up to counter it, which then makes that creep down, but then makes the other one creep, you know, so, yeah. Thank you. I see another question from Maren. Yeah, um, I was wondering whether um, there are other behaviors apart from the, um, from the courtship song that affects how likely females are to mate, because I, I mean, I don't know much about crickets, but from my, one of my colleagues who is a, cricketeer um 
they also have this antenation behavior and, and other courtship behaviors that are not song related. So, so do the, the flat wings show at least that behavior or perhaps even more than the others? So it's funny you ask that because we, um, I had been trying to get a pretty um, big uh, uh, project going looking at cuticular hydrocarbons, which are of course the, um, the chemical signals that are used for short. So they're not pheromones, but they're the chemicals that are um, on the surface of all insects and well, uh, some other arthropods. Um, and that, as you say, the male and female are antenating each other and um, they're detecting chemical signals that way. Um, Unfortunately, the student that was working on this um, has had a lot of difficulties in their project and it's not, you know, it has not panned out, but yeah, I was really interested in that as well. And I've been wondering whether particularly in habitats where cuticular hydrocarbons are important in resisting desiccation, which is one of the things that they're important in doing, whether that has played a role in ameliorating some of the rest of this. So, so, so the short term answer is, Yes, I think that chemical signals are also potentially important. I've been trying to work on them and it, we haven't gotten as far as I, as I would have liked, but you know, stay tuned. Do we have any questions from the audience? Joao, yes, please. Joao Meneses, if you could uh, go ahead, introduce yourself. Hi there, uh, I'm Joao. I'm a PhD student at UMass Amherst, United States. Uh, thank you so much for a wonderful talk, Marlene, and such cool research. Uh, I was actually wondering, uh, I had a similar question to uh, what you both were just talking about, uh, about whether males have any other way of uh, any other kind of long range communication. Uh, but I, I guess you said you're interested, but don't know yet. Uh, and the other question is, uh, have you noticed any other morphological aspect of males that might be correlated to flat wings? And specifically, uh, I'm talking about other kinds of ornaments. So, so the first part is that, that crickets, unlike some insects, don't have other long range um, uh, uh, signals. So they're, you know, the, the cuticular hydrocarbons, like I said, they're not pheromones, so they're not volatilized. They're just like surface molecules that are detected once the male and female are in contact with each other. We do know that flat wings and normal wings don't seem to have characteristically different um, CHCs, so for what that's worth, but, uh, you know, and then in terms of morphology, remember they're nocturnal, so they're not going to have any non-acoustic signals because you couldn't see them. Um, almost, and, and the other thing, so one of the interesting things I think about crickets is that um, they belie a lot of uh, everybody's kind of assumptions about stuff like body size, like bigger males really are not at a particular advantage under these circ you know, circumstances. The females are bigger than the males anyway. And um, we've measured some stuff about body size and it doesn't really seem to make any difference. Um, these crickets also don't have, unlike some species, don't have burrows, so they don't have permanent residences that they're defending um, in situations where it might be advantageous to be bigger. So, so no, they're just crickets. They just call. They're, they're, they're just crickets. That's, that's kind of the motto. Thank you. Clara, Clara Jones, next question. Hi, um, thanks for your work. And um, I'm Clara Jones, Clara B. Jones, retired mammals. Um, I connect very much to your suggestion that this is uh, frequency dependent. It, in fact, it has to be because um, if flat winged males consistently had higher reproductive success, then the whole population would be um, flat winged males. Now, if I remember Austad's work sufficiently, he argues, and I'm sure others do, that in order for alternative morphs or phenotypes to evolve, their fitness over time 
has to be equal. It would be so cool, uh, assuming then that we have frequency dependence going on, it would be so cool to identify the conditions under which the non flat wing males have higher fitness. Yep. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I thanks for that because your thinking and my thinking seem to have converted. You know, yeah, no, absolutely. And I, I really do think that I was hoping to. That was what I part of what I was referring to with the the links and the hair part is that I was refer I was going to try to parameterize this much more closely. It turns out to be harder to do for a variety of reasons. But yeah, you're absolutely right. A population of just flat wings should disappear unless for some reason, you know, I mean, the whole thing should, should just come crashing to a halt. Um, and it is absolutely, yeah, I mean, I, I can't do anything other than say, yes, you're right. Um, that's, that's how it should work. Part of the problem in trying to nail down the conditions under which this is going to happen is that for reasons that I do not understand, all of the populations have been declining, even the ones on the big island where, um, you know, there's no flat wings, the fly population, you know, nothing seems to have changed particularly. Um, and I've been racking my brains to figure that out. And I, there's nothing I can, I can think of. They occur in disturbed habitats anyway. So they don't really, you know, they don't really go places where they would be subject to a lot of other environmental disturbance. So it's, it's a mystery, but yeah, I absolutely, I, I completely concur with what you're saying. Thanks a lot. I'm listed next, but we're going to skip me and go to David Wood. David? Hi, I'm David. I'm a PhD student at Yale in the United States. Thanks for this super interesting talk. How lucky are we all that, that you found this system in this incredible time of turmoil? Um, I'm wondering about the, the flat wing male satelliting behavior and where that could have arisen from and if that's something that the, the normal males do also or and, and how quickly that um, arose with these flat wing males when, you know, if it's less than 20 generations, how, how tightly these, these adaptations are. Yeah. Thanks for asking that because I probably scooted over that a little too quickly. Um, that sort of satellite behavior is well established in crickets period. And the normal wing males do it too. It's just that the flat wing males seem to do it more. And, um, uh, in fact, one of the one of my I didn't have time to put the slide in, but one of my former PhD students, um, Rachel Olzer, found that intriguingly, flat wing males seem to be pickier about which males' song they're attracted to compared to normal wing males. So both normal and flat wing males will respond to a playback, and they'll settle at some distance away from it. Um, but the flat wing males seem to be more responsive to songs that have the same long chirp character um, proportion as females prefer. They're both doing it, but there seems to have been this moderation in what the flat wings are responding to, which I think is really cool. But yeah, thanks for asking that because I think it, it allowed me to clarify that a little bit. Thank you. Before I ask my next question, anyone else who hasn't asked a question who would like to take Lauren, I, um, yes, please. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Lord Lauren Heiss. I'll, I'll defer to Logan, he's a student, so. Logan, go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna real quick ask, I don't know if you already answered this, but do you, have you seen any development of this um, or spreading of this trait onto the mainland populations, the flat wings? I don't know if you talked about that or not. Um, I did not, and remember, I wouldn't expect to because, um, well, okay. So that's actually kind of an intriguing question for two reasons. So no, certainly not in teleogrillas because they don't get to fly anywhere else. What a lot of people have asked me and what I've been curious about is, well, so Ormeocratia parasitizes a lot of North American cricket species in the genus Grillus. Um, and they've been studied by a bunch of people, including, um, uh, including uh, Tom Walker, who's now retired um, uh, in, in Florida. Um, and, and a bunch of his colleagues, uh, Bill Cade, who originally found the whole system, um, who uh, um, is also now retired. Uh, David Gray is working on it. Um, there's, a, there's several other people who have been studying them in North America. And um, 
to my knowledge, none of these people have ever seen flat wings in gorillas in North America that are subject to um, Ormeocratia. And again, this is kind of like my answer with the other thing with the fly where, you know, I can come up with all these scenarios and one of them must be true, but you know, like each one sounds more improbable than the one before. And for this, my suspicion is, so Teleogrillus oceanicus um, breeds year round. So they're, con they're continuously, they're producing three to four generations a year. All of the North American grillines that um, are parasitized by Ormia are seasonal. They're not necessarily diapausing, but they're at least like bivoltine. So they'll get like a burst in the spring and a burst in the fall. And then in between times, the populations will be at very, very low levels. And so what I've wondered is maybe you don't get flat wing or maybe you don't get the mutation becoming established because you don't have continuous enough selection against normal wings while there's still a few flat wings there for it to kind of catch hold. Um, whether that's true or not, I don't know. But it is kind of striking that, you know, there's this weird mutation, you know, it's a single gene, how hard can it be? Um, and uh, yet you don't see flat wings um, in like Gorillus rubens or Gorillus um, texensis or any of the other species that are parasitized or lineatoseps any of the other species that are parasitized by uh, Ormia in North America. Lauren? Thanks for that wonderful talk, Marlene. Um, I'm not, I apologize, if, like, like Eduardo, when I'm, even when I'm sort of co-hosting, I'm not fully paying attention, watching other things. Um, do you know if there are any other mechanisms by which females can select or the preferential male. I know you said they're just crickets, but do they have like sperm storage? Um, are they multiple? Um, it, or on the other side, is there sperm competition? Yep, they make multiply, and um, there seems to be last male sperm precedence that's been established in lots of other work, most a lot of which uh, done by Lee Simmons. Um, and uh, probably what's happening is that females. I, actually, it's interesting you say that. I've gotten interested both in sort of the sperm storage thing, but also in the question of um, the temporal patterning of egg laying. So in other words, if, so females can lay hundreds of eggs, do they mate with a male, fertilize a bunch of eggs, lay that bunch of eggs, then mate with another male, fertilize a bunch of eggs, then lay that bunch of eggs, or do they mate with a male and then if he's not a great male, wait until they maybe get a better male and then that way they'll, all of their eggs will be fertilized by him. Like what's the patterning of oviposition relative to mating and with whom? And I have a student who's getting interested in that. And so I, I may be able to answer that, but that's the way I think it might be happening. There is certainly sperm competition and females absolutely mate more than once. And I guess the, next, the related, if I could follow up the related yeah. question is if you've got these males that are attracted to the calling males, right? I understand the system, you got the calling males and the non-calling males get come closer. How does that play out? Does it, what would allow for those non-calling males to actually mate? They have to be in the pathway basically of, you know, ah. I, it's funny because when I talk about this with people who aren't scientists, they always have this much more deterministic image of animal behavior than I think those of us who actually do animal behavior have where you know they say oh so the males are going up to where the male is and then they're waiting like on the place and then when the female comes you know and it's like okay it's dark and they're just crickets um and so like i think it's just you know everything's a crapshoot right i mean what they're doing is they're they have little things in their head that make them go that make them be phonotactic they walk over to where a sound is and then they sit there and then if a female bangs into them, then they may or may not be able to mate with her. And it all seems very like kind of hit or miss, but you know, that's insects for you. Thank you, that's fascinating. But, but you know what I mean though? Like, like yeah. that, that I, I often have trouble explaining to people that it's, it's not like the insects are sitting there like plotting, like, well, and then if, if she moves over here, then I'll be able to, you know, for one thing they can barely see. Huh. Well, very cool. Thanks. 
Your answer, Marlene, to Lauren's question, it's really connecting to what I was planning on, on asking, which is to, which takes us to your very first few remarks about uh, whether we understand the nature nurture debate dispute and the extent to which behavior is, is amenable to that. And, but I also wanna just make a couple of comments. I mean, I'm listening to this, taking it in and, and so much of what you said, I can imagine being so helpful for our students trying to understand the broader impacts of their research. With your talk, I can see the broader impact and I can really take this and your description of how, well, these were the only things that I could manipulate in the lab, right? But then there are all these other explanations that I cannot handle. And so, the, for example, as you were explaining frequency dependence, and we try to tackle huge questions that are important to our society, or questions that relate to human behavior, here are wonderful examples of what we have learned from a presumably simpler system, the complexity of a presumably simpler system, the, the non-deterministic nature of the behavior of a cricket. So, so all that for me informs, and now I go back to, to the question at the beginning, informs how we should be looking at behavior, how we should be looking at behavior uh, for crickets and for humans, definitely. So in all of the writing and talking you're doing in trying to get more broader audiences to understand the evolution of behavior first, are you aware, and for those of you who are not from the US, is there a difference between the US and other parts of the world in terms of how this nature nurture debate is not yet dead? I mean, this is, I mean, it frustrates me the point to which I have to tell students again and again, and remember for me, it's even worse, because I teach much more in an anthropological context, right? So, so the issues that I think you were alluding to come up all the time. I mean, any time that I talk to somebody, a student studying human behavior, even more if it comes from a cultural perspective, there we go with the nature nurture. So one is, is there a difference across the world? And the other one is, how are you handling on, on, on a, a real life situation when you find yourself arguing in favor of these ideas that you presented and you get pushback. And this is just learning how you're navigating those situations to see what I can learn from your own experience. Yeah, I, thanks for that. I, I, that's really interesting. And I, I think, so first of all, and, I, and uh, somebody said, um, now I can't, somebody, I did see the chat go by that, that yeah, you know, people, oh, Maren, um, so yeah, I mean, I think people, this is this first thing that people get is, you know, oh, is this behavior learned or is it, you know, from your genes? And I think that unfortunately, the emphasis on modern genomic technology has done nothing but encourage people to have bizarre ideas about this stuff. And this is why we're getting, you know, so they've got, people have certainly gone away from saying, oh, there's a gene for being, you know, intelligent or there's a gene for being whatever. But now they think, oh, right, right. But it's many genes, in but it's still, just the genes. And that's just as ill-informed an opinion as thinking there's one gene. And so I like people, you know, GWAS is just a terrible thing to put in the hands of a lot of people. I mean, I, I just, I, I really, you know, I just quake in fear of all these. And this is where you get those headlines of dog ownership is in your genes. And, and so like, I, I teach a graduate course for our whole first year cohort in EEB in which, you know, one of the things I, I've said is that this came up recently because we just started doing behavior and a lot of people who do ecology, especially if they're doing ecosystem or, you know, something that's pretty far removed from organismal level uh, uh, stuff, you know, they just still have this, you know, well, but, you know, that's what the behavior people do is they sort out like what's, what's, what's genetic and what's learned. And I said, you know, I'm going to tell you this as many times as it's going to take that all traits, whether they're behavioral or not, get input from the genes and input from the environment all traits, period, all the time. And then they'll say, well, but surely, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I'll say, nope, all traits, all the time. And I, I, I don't, I guess what I'm saying is I don't know how to tell people because I clearly have not been terribly successful at it, but, but this is one of the things that really interests me. And I think sometimes looking at animals helps because people really are capable of understanding that animals respond to both it, environmental, i.e. training, you know, sort of input, and that they have their own inherent, if you want to put it that way, characteristics. 
and that those two interact a lot. So one of the things with a new book that I tried to do is to say, look, we can understand where behavior comes from, at least to a certain extent. And there's, you know, it kind of defangs the argument to say, well, all behavior is going to have a genetic component. Sure. If you, if it, you know, like if it makes you happy to think that there's a genetic component to dog ownership, then knock yourself out. But it's not going to be any different than pointing out that there's an environmental component to how big, you know, your liver is, right? Okay. Really? Is that getting you any further in anything? It's not, it's not really helping. And, and so I, I think that if you can talk about behavior as not being distinct from other traits, it kind of makes it not so mysterious and you don't end up saying, oh, but you can't talk about intelligence being genetic. Well, it's gotta be, gen everything is genetic. How can it not be genetic? That has nothing to do with there being a gene for being smart. Now, going on to the practicalities, uh how do you react? I mean, the problem is that even journals like PNAS, right? How do we change that? And I yeah, ask, I, I ask you about PNAS because uh, so if the Journal of the Academy of Sciences continues to choose having cool and attractive titles for papers that are then picked up by the media, so aren't those small things that maybe we could be trying? to change as authors? No, sorry. This is, yes, it is a nuanced and certain title to my paper because my science is nuanced and uncertain. Can we? Yeah, yeah. No, that I, that's a super good point and I don't have any, because at the same time, like I respect that there are people who think, I mean, it also gets to, to anthropomorphism. I mean, you work on primates for God's sake, you know, like I at least, you know, at least with crickets, people don't, <laughs> you know, anthropomorphize them quite so much, but like everybody's really into primates, you know, non-human primates being just like people in little fur monkey suits, you know, and, and it just, and at the same time, I have colleagues who say the only way we're going to be able to make our work relevant to the public is by reflecting it in terms that the public will understand. Did you guys all see, there was a paper recently with, where somebody was talking about privilege and inheritance in um, animals. It was in behavioral ecology. Um, and I have, okay, like I'm sure the people that did the study were doing great work and it was, I, like I actually haven't read it in detail. I really cringed a little bit because that word privilege got- Can somebody, got if, by can somebody if somebody knows, can, can somebody add some, some words in the chatting? So I, I know I have not seen it. Yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. Well, I mean, basically, it was an article about. I mean, Kai, you, you, maybe you can you can point it out if you saw it. But I had very mixed feelings about it because to me, it was it was again making this connection. Like, yes, humans do things that other animals do, but I think you start using loaded words like that, and it, it makes me a little nervous. Well, lucky you that you only have mixed feelings. I have really very strong feelings against it. <laughs> Uh, but but but, but so, so yeah, have... so, but but Kaya, do you want to say anything about yeah, it? I, I'm curious to know what you think. Sure, and this might you know be pushing you in a direction that you don't want to go um, if it is a little uncomfortable. But um, and and let me know if that's the wrong article that um, you were referring to. But it was uh, actually by Jennifer Smith who was on Sign um, a while ago. Um, I, I guess like at how how we could think of it um, in terms of like these frustrating questions of nature versus nurture and also like what makes humans so unique, et cetera, how would that come, keep coming up and um, over and over again. Uh, like it, it helps to think of why it's so important to people um, to keep answering these questions that don't really make sense. And it, in my head and in like a lot of people's minds, um, it is connected to just societal hierarchies and white supremacy and um, just like the, the way that we have been socialized to see the world and to justify it in genetic terms so that it is, it is a natural order rather than just a social order. Because if you take that fundamental basis away for people's understanding of the world, then it kind of throws kind of everything into question, right? And the, the fairness of it all. No, I think that's absolutely true. No, I, I that's, and, and that's clearly, I mean, sometimes it's well hidden and sometimes it's not at all hidden um, that that's people's motivation. No, I, I, I absolutely think that's, that's true. One of my concerns too, though, is that in trying to counter that, 
that what you don't want to then say is, okay, but nothing is genetic, you know, there that, you know, genetics is not important at all, or it's important in animals, but not in people, which certainly doesn't make sense. And so how we're going to navigate this is not obvious to me, but I, yeah, I absolutely agree that that's where, that's where a lot of the, that's where a lot of the stuff is, is coming from. And actually in my first book, one of the things I was concerned with was that people were doing this with gender and that there was this big push that, oh, okay, so we're going to stop using elephant seals um, and, you know, baboons as, you know, these, you know, and saying that, oh, well, see, there you go, you know, animals have this inevitable, you know, this is where the patriarchy comes from, because, you know, animals have this male dominant thing, and it's just in our genes, and this is whatever. And to me, the response is not to say, oh, but there's also bonobos, where there's, you know, lots of food sharing and sex between females, and there's also seahorses where the males sort of get pregnant. Like that is not the answer is to start doing these counter examples. The point is that we're not supposed to be deriving our social principles from, you know, snow geese. I mean, this is just not a thing. And, and that doesn't detract from how interesting, valuable and important it is to look at the behavior of other animals. And I think that that's been a hard needle to thread, and that's a lot of what I what I want to try and do. And so that's why I think it's important to focus on it is that you don't just want to say we can't talk about this because people are going to use it to foster white supremacy. That that's that's not enough. But uh, what I uh, and this is the the part of our meetings that I sometimes like because we can really go. There are no topics that we cannot talk we cannot talk about Kaya as long as they're related to the the expertise of the speaker, etc. So uh, now, for me, well, what's becoming very, very important is to really, uh, are we going to accept that the different forums for the different types of conversations, there are different outlets for different types of writing. If, if it's a behavioral ecology journal, and I look at the mission of the journal, most likely, I don't remember it, but it really speaks of reporting science therefore should not become a journal for reporting activism on any topic of your choice. And, and so if we don't, if, if, if we don't, I, I don't, I think that if, unless we were active and we commit to understanding that there's fears or spaces and times for different types of conversations, it cannot all be, become a conversation about our political views. Because, and, and that's what's happening. I mean, it starts with the titles of the papers that are declarative, that are picked by the media, and depending who picks it up, they're used one way or the other. But suddenly, this was a title of a manuscript in the journal of the National Academy of Sciences. So this is about science. Nobody, and, and I think that we were gonna, we were hurting ourselves as scientists when we're trying to do both. We, we can, of course, we will all have views that we want to share as, as citizens, but we have to, I think we have to find some boundaries. When, when we're talking about just my little signs that I do in this corner, and these are crickets, right, in the night looking for a female, and then if you want, we can go have a drink and talk about what I can make up after three beers of what the crickets do in terms of the genetics of human behavior. Those are different things, and as scientists, we need to contribute to, to keeping those different, I think. I think there's some truth to that, but I think um, as teachers, we do have a duty to teach evolution with a specifically like anti-racist approach because people's minds do go there um, and people are searching for those kinds of answers. And so, um, you know, whether it's when you're giving a talk for a general public or for an undergraduate class, I think it does need to be addressed. And that means that like, that means equipping ourselves with the knowledge of how to do it and the understanding of, you know, the sociology behind it, rather than just saying, I'm a scientist, I'm not a sociologist, it's not my job. Yeah, I, 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 but I'm glad, I'm gonna feel comfortable saying that I disagree because we need, I think that's part of the, what we need to do. We need to be able to disagree and keep talking. I tell my students, I have all kinds of views and I'll be delighted to stay after we finish lecture to talk about my views. But my employer has given me the space and time and salary. And I told my employer that I'm, the course is about this. Unless I bring it onto the syllabus and the title and description, that we're gonna spend X amount of time talking about issues that do not belong in how we measure behavior. 
then I don't go there. Because once I go there, then what is the course about? I mean, I, your students were saying, but hold it. When I read the syllabus, when I sign up, you said it's, this is about measuring behavior. So I'm always open to say, let's go for lunch, for coffee, or for whatever we talk about it. But there has to be a time when it's only, I mean, are we gonna do that also when we teach math? So suddenly you go in for a course on math and then we're gonna start talking instead of teaching you how to do math. I, 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 because when we do them, that student loses half hour of actual math. So that's where I have my doubts. But it, it doesn't necessarily have to be a part of every class. It can be part of one. Um, I think that you lose a lot by not doing it because you risk sending your whole class out into the world without a well-rounded view of what, how to, how to apply what you're teaching into the, I think about, um, you know, the world uh, through this lens. Laura, John, jump in. I mean, I think that instead of me calling, we're having a wonderful, I suggest that just go ahead, <laughs> jump in the dialogue. I think one thing that <clears throat> if I'm, again, I was sort of half listening, half tracking, so I apologize if I'm a little off track here, but um, I think one of the things that if we're talking about sort of being more inclusive in our science and education, if, if I'm on the right, if, am I following the conversation properly here? Um, is that, you know, you can do it in ways that, that is just sharing information that is not often shared without being controversial. So Eduardo, so for like some of my classes, I actually will try to teach different perspectives on behavior that have been ignored largely because of society's emphasis on um, largely European North American science. And so I think we can, we can address some of these issues without being, I guess the word controversial, just by sharing what others have learned and just haven't been um, taught to students for so long. Agreed. Does that make sense? Oh yeah, and I agree. Keeping in mind that I doubt it, you have been able to assess what Chinese, Russians, or any other people who contribute to this diversity have done about behavior because we don't read Russian or Chinese. But I can teach about so, Charles Turner's work, which was largely ignored for uh, you know right. almost several yeah. decades, and 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 show research by younger scientists who are, um, you know, who are somewhat ignored, you know, and just try and be more inclusive in like the perspectives on behavior that I introduce in a class. Oh, I agree. That I think that's that's a, the kind of thoughtful. We, it still relates to the course, the response for teaching. I mean, mm -hmm. you're speaking to how, unless you understand that history, you cannot fully understand the progress we've made in different areas of behavior, for example. I mean, in primatology, there's always the example about how so much of primatology was heavily influenced by Japanese researchers in the early days. And the extent to, it, it's, a, it's a fascinating and critical question as well, the extent to which the focus on dominance male dominance and certain types of primate societies, uh, there's lots of us who think that it's, it seems very reasonable that it must have been influenced maybe by Japanese culture, which on top it was primarily male Japanese researchers. So I think that I agree with that, yeah. Any other hands? We're almost out of time. This was, this was a wonderful exchange of ideas. Why don't we give our, our guest today, Marlene, any any closing comments that you want to share with us? And then no, that, I mean, that was really interesting. And I think, you know, this is the sort of thing that I, I grapple with. And it's part of why I do like writing books of a more yeah. general nature. I mean, I, I and I encourage people who are interested in it to, to try and do this, too, that it's I think sometimes it's easy to think that doing that kind of writing is a matter of taking the the facts that you found and dumbing them down enough so that people without background can understand them. And I think it's about a lot more than that. And it is about understanding other things that, that we're trying to do. Um, so, so no, I, 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 appreciate, I appreciate everybody's comments. Uh, I, can I say one thing? Yes, please. Um, this is really interesting. And thanks for making the time for this. Um, I, uh, 
I just want to um, point out that I think um, like the younger generations are moving much faster than the older generations on these kind, you know, the way the language that they use to discuss these things and the social movements that they're very much a part of. Um, and like I'm 34, but I still feel like I'm I'm always catching up on like you know how how to even have these conversations. Um, and I have done a lot of learning from the students that I've taught on this. And so actually even just having like holding space for discussion, like spending a little bit of time in class for them to lead, um, especially on these sort of impactful, um, you know, connections between our research and the way the power hierarchy is and the, and the way that the world sort of um, moves uh, is, is a really great opportunity for us to, to kind of uh, think about it more and to learn a lot more. And I'll just give a really quick example. I was um, just giving a, a guest lecture on like for an intro bio class. Um, it was virtual, it was for Columbia. And um, I was just giving their like evolution module. And in one of the breakout groups, um, the TA came back from like looping around into the main room where I was. And he said, one of the student groups is really, really upset. And um, they're wondering why you're teaching evolution just like the old way and why you're not talking about what, how it, it integrates into uh, racism and power hierarchies um, and the historical use of evolution to um, propagate racism. And um, so I went and had a discussion with the, with the students. I gave them space to talk about it and I learned a lot. And for the very next day, for the next section, I put in a whole section on that and it made it very engaging. They were really, um, into it. And then they were also very grateful to have that space. So I think that that's something that they need and ask for and that we should listen to them. Sure. Thanks for, I, I, I am delighted to see all of us feeling comfortable in sharing views and talking this way. Thank you, Kaya. Uh, you, you've been showing the way to your younger peers because you're always, Kaya is, is a regular at the meetings and always asking questions. And, and I think that's so important. That's why we keep encouraging everyone to feel comfortable at asking and, and challenging. And, and that's what it, it sh this should be about. So this is great. Marlene, a pleasure uh, listening to your presentation. Thank you so much for your time. And I think it's now we, we should give our speaker a, a well-earned break and then go back to your, I'm sure you have all kinds of wonderful things waiting for you in your inbox. All right, uh, great, thanks. Thank you, and we'll be in touch. Thanks a lot. All right. I see you Thursday. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Eh, I know that Federico, Federico, hi, how are you doing? Hablas español, así que veo que Federico puso unas cosas. Yo tampoco, I mean, I try not to, I, I don't keep an eye much on the chatting. Eh, I just cannot follow both. Eh, Miles also wrote, hi, Miles, how are you doing? You're still there. Eh, well, this was good. This was good. I don't know, Marlene is frozen. Oh, my goodness, we're still alive. We forgot yeah. about.